It's my pleasure to introduce John Smart. Here he comes. He's going to be talking, I think he's going to be talking about uh, his nonprofit Brain Preservation Foundation. Yeah. Here he is, John. Uh, brain Preservation. Um, fortunately, we don't have to explain a lot of this stuff to, to our... Our audience. Um, I've got uh, 40 sli 38 slides in 45 minutes, but there's really only 20 slides that I think are important. We're, we're going to kind of stop on a slide called uploading, which I know a lot of people have heard of. And it's, it's really the reason why I titled my talk, Realizing a New Human Option to Live Again. It's an interesting play on words. Because we have the science of cryonics and now chemopreservation, which is trying to realize the physical possibility of preserving brain. But we've also got kind of a mental shift we have to do. We ask ourselves, uh, well, is that valuable? And would I want to be uploaded? And so we have to personally realize the value of that if, if we decide that that's useful to us. So, those are the two themes of my talk, um, the technical and the, um, the mental or psychological. Yeah. I, I really sorry. Um, this is your thought about this, but I want to. Uh-huh. And did you try this third one here? Yeah. Said the fourth one. <laughs> yeah, fourth from the left. I was just going to use the last. Yeah, try that. Fourth from the left. All right. There we go. See if the clicker works. Yay. All right. There we go. Good. So I'm a co-founder of a small nonprofit called the Brain Preservation Foundation. We started in 2010, and um, we're going to talk about that and why it might be useful, and get your questions. Um, I think there's a break, it's a half hour break afterwards, so Hank said I can go out here for more questions, but we'll have time for a few questions at the end. So, the subtitle is, uh, the title is Brain Preservation, subtitle Realizing a New Human Option to Live Again. And those two realizations are the words that I wanted to get across, right? There's kind of the science, and then there's the mental decision, is this valuable? What is this stuff? And I'm going to try and explain why if we can inexpensively preserve our brains. And the inexpensive for me is, is key. See um, more and more people will say, hey, well, that's actually a good thing. You know, I might want to do that. So let's get to the first slide. Um, it's like the not working, so I'm going to try that. There you go. Uh, if you think about it, there's really there's at least six ways that we can live beyond our biological life right now. Uh, the obvious one is in our children, our genes and our memes that we pass on. Uh, and then our works, right? The physical things that we do, the words we leave behind, the, the artistic project. And again, those are our memes and our teams. Remember what teams are? Susan Blackmore's concept of a technological algorithm that replicates in culture, right? So it's kind of like a, a fundamental replicating idea that replicates in brains, and team is a fundamental algorithm replicates in, in society. So it's the idea that technology is encoding its own intelligence and learning to process, as uh, Monica would say, learning to process bottom up uh, very holistically. And now we're learning that we can leave behind our experiences. Uh, some people who have glass, and these are lifelongs, aren't they? Some people have these lapel cameras now. And there's going to be kids who are going to leave behind a whole life of experience. Some people saw Final Cut with Robin Williams. It's a great movie that takes us to uh, this idea of doing a final cut of your life log to play at your, at your funeral. I think it's like a Black Mirror, uh, Charlie Booker's Black Mirror has a really nice uh, life log uh, film that's being auctioned right now. Uh, I think uh, Robert Downey Jr. is going to play it. 
version of that, to bring the life log concept into the kind of mass consciousness. It's an interesting idea. And simulations. How many people have heard of Eternity Me? Anybody? No? So that's a MIT startup that basically is creating a virtual avatar off of your email and, and all of your social network stuff. So basically you can talk to mom or dad after they're gone. Because you have this really primitive uh, avatar of mom's dad. And this thing is going to be terribly uh, primitive. But there's already, a, I hear 5,000 people who signed up for the email, you know, to be first notified at attorney, E-T-E-R-N-I dot N-E. So, so agents, you're going to leave behind an agent, and your kids are going to have to decide, do you want to let your agent get smarter every year? Are you going to let Google make your agent smarter every year by talking to all of your surviving friends? Because that agent is going to get smarter. Or are you going to leave it at the level of the digital scrapbook that your mom or your dad tuned it up to just before they died, right? You say, okay, that's enough. It's too creepy to go past that. But I'm starting to sell you, I'm getting you the green here, I'm selling you on things, ways of living beyond your biological life that are more and more different from what we historically did. So in the blue, there's two more. And these come from actually preserving the physical structure of your brain. One is your memories, basically leaving behind your experiences, which can be read. A lot of neuroscientists think those memories are going to be readable like a hard drive, like, a, like an archaeological dig, without bringing the person back. Because we know consciousness is actually a whole different set of things that happen on top of a cortex that stores memories. And just like an anesthesiologist can operate on you, or, or, or a neurosurgeon can operate on you, while well, an anesthesiologist keeps you out of consciousness, a scan of a brain that's uploaded into a computer can extract memories without creating consciousness, without creating self-perception, without creating neural synchrony across large collections of neurons, that's what consciousness is, in an uploaded brain. So there'll be people who, for psychological or religious reasons might not want to come back in person, but would they be willing to give their memories to the future? Well, if it's, you know, uh, uh, some culture that isn't well represented, if you saw something that was evil and didn't get punished, and you want to give that to the future as like a digital forensics, if you want to give your memories to your kids, to put into this avatar, but you feel comfortable that the avatar is not going to wake up and be you, because that's what you said. You trust the people that you're signing this, this uh, re uh, brain preservation contract with. Well, then you might decide to do number five, but not number six. And so now we get to number six, which is kind of the most controversial, but the most um, maybe closest to the heart of a lot of the transhumanists, and that is coming back yourself. And so I'd like to ask, before we get off this slide, uh, if if you had the option to preserve your brain when you die, um, you know, you had the money, you had the, the option, um, and you believe that it was te that technically you could be brought back in the future, and I'm going to give one more specific here. You believe that you'd probably be brought back in a computer, and probably it would happen while your kids are still alive, because that's how fast it see technology advancing. So it's not like it's going to be 200, 300 years in the future when you know, it might not be, you don't know anybody. No, you'd be coming back when people that you know, your kids, some of your friends, are still alive. So that's my setup of the situation. What percentage of people here would want to do that? And what percentage of people think, okay, you know, you just have to convince me. Like, so it's a good fraction, even in the transhumanist community, to say, you know, what's the value of this, right? Okay, well, I'm going I'm to leave you with, and this is why the second, the realizing the second part is, we have to convince ourselves that this is valuable, right? So we have to, we really have to think it through, and we have to see evidence, I think, too. <clears throat> so that's the question I asked at the bottom of the slide, and I said. One definition of meaning in algorithmic information theory, and I should take a side here, there's a kind of information theory called Shannon information theory. You've heard of it? And it's, it's communication information theory. It's
says nothing about the meaning of the information that's being transmitted down the pipe. Information theory today, as Monica was saying, uh, you know, uh, basic molecular biology is like going from genes to an organism. Information th theory today is in the absolute infancy. If you want to understand the meaning of information, you need to go to something called algorithmic information theory. Shannon's theory is communication information theory. And so what's the meaning of information? What's the meaning of computing? Well, today, information theorists, theory of computation, philosophers argue about what information is, <laughs> what, what meaning of information is. But one interesting definition, if you really read that literature, is more meaningful information, more meaningful patterns of information, is information that endures longer. So a whole some, uh, literature thing that was written in the 1800s might not be around today, or it might. But some physics that was discovered in the, in the 1600s, Principia Mathematica, that has endured longer. And it endures with less alteration of its basic form. I mean, there's been extensions made to the physics of, uh, of classical mechanics but that information has endured longer. So the question I'd like to ask you is, do you think that if you, if you could live longer than your biological life, and you could continue to grow, to create, and discover you know, all the things that seem most fundamental to life, and so your actual informational pattern would continue to change, but there'd be pieces that would stay the same, right? From your history. Do you think that that would be a more meaningful life. Well, by, by that definition of, of information theory, it would be. And so that's, that's the one I use, right? So I actually think, when I ask myself, well, well how do I want to live? I want to live in a way that's as meaningful as possible to my kids, to my friends, and to society at large. Everybody has to come up with their own definition, don't they? That's fine. And so it's a really interesting question, number six, and we can see there's a lot that has to be thought about to make that jump, to say, well, yeah, that's something that would be valuable to me and possibly to others. Next slide. So Asimov was given the option of chronic suspension. Someone said, hey, I will we'll preserve you. And he said, well, why would I want to do that? I've written 500 books. I think he said 550. <laughs> And that's brilliant, isn't it? Because he'd gotten all of the memes that he cared about out into his post-biological life. That'd be, it's beautiful. So we can see how people take different choices. Next slide. And with Google Now and the lapel cam that you see, there's 500 LAPD going to be having this camera this year. Um, and there's wrist PC that's eventually coming, right? Every kid. In the third world, is going to have one of these lovely wrist PCs with a little neodymium magnet. You just pop it off, and there's your cell phone. And the thing's just recording, and it's listening, and it's basically a piece of your wearable you. And it has a life log, doesn't it? It's got maybe an audio life log or a video life log of your entire life, searchable by, by voice. And that's, you know, within 10 years, we can see, you can see that kind of camera. And here's the intern in me. There's the home page, like I mentioned at the bottom. Um, it's called MIT Startup. And Greg Panos at Persona Foundation was one of the first totally digitized several hundred uh, hours of his mother's uh, conversation so that he could build this avatar. You know, he thinks it's going to be like 10 years in the future. It'll be important. And so he did this while his mother was getting older. It's a kind of personal ethnography. Right? People take their own approach into this. And so that's another way we're going to be living beyond, uh, um, beyond our biological life. And it's going to change the conversation. And people arguing, is it valuable to have you got glass on? Yes. Can be, is it valuable to have glass? When is it valuable to have the thing turned on? Okay. Next slide. <clears throat> glass will probably soon be able to do peak experience summaries. All that video. I don't want to look at it. I want to look at the peak five minutes, don't I? Of the last hour, the last week, whatever. So auto-summarizing tools, as they get better, we'll start to see the value of these kinds of things. And we'll extract more meaning, back to that, that M word, out of our experiences that are more useful to us and others. So Sebastian Sung in his book Connectome and his Wired Differently nonprofit believes that we are this connectome. What's the connectome? It's the connection of all of those uh, hundreds.
hundred million, um, hundred billion neurons uh, in our brain, right? and it's the synaptic weightings at the end of those connections. And the question is, is that you? And modern neuroscience, uh, most neuroscientists say yes, that's that's me. Right? So we started Preservation Foundation in 2010. And there's a president who is a, uh, Ken Hayworth, who is a neuroscientist now at Janelia Farm, which is one of the leading neuroscience labs on the East Coast in, in Virginia. And before that, he was at Harvard. Uh, and these uh, particular uh, technologies that he's using in the, in the electron microscope to the right is basically a microscope that will slice through a brain by actually ablating a brain that's been preserved and plasticized and it actually sands it away with focused ion beams, and then it looks with an electron microscope, and it uploads all that molecular information into a computer. Does that make sense? That's what FIBS is. Yeah. We have completely uploaded preserved brains of zebrafish. We're working on flies right now, neuroscientists, trying to get an entire fly brain. But a zebrafish is brain is about the size of a tip of a pencil. Can we read memories from our zebrafish brain? We trained it to go to a certain corner of the aquarium, and now we can upload it. Now we... No, because we haven't broken the long-term memory code. Okay? When we break the long-term memory code, that's going to be huge. A lot of people are going to start thinking, well, hey, yeah, my memories, they pulled right out. They got them out of the zebrafish, so they'll get them out of me. Make sense? Okay. So lots of neuroscientists work on the long-term memory code. Next slide. So we got a bunch of uh, uh, PhDs from various neuroscience and computer science and, uh, and medical backgrounds um, who are advisors on our project. Next slide. And we have a technology prize that an anonymous donor put up, um, plus a few non-anonymous people. Um, and we're giving 25% of that to the first whole mouse brain that has been preserved that looks uh, the ultrastructure looks good throughout the entire brain on an electron microscope, and we take random samples and circuit trace at various places. And 75% of it is for the first whole pig brain that has been preserved using these techniques. And the important thing about the pig brain is it will have been preserved in the same way you would have preserved a human brain, by cannulating the cerebral arteries and getting the chemicals through the arteries. Okay. Next slide. We don't preserve people at BPF. We don't advocate any particular procedure or company. Uh, we want to assess the efficacy and affordability of these procedures. And if, they, if uh, procedures that are verified, uh, that are affordable, uh, can be verified, then we want to improve global accessibility and patients' rights. Next slide. So this brings us to cryonics, the pioneers, right? Robert Ettinger, uh, fantastic. Transhumanist. Just read you know, all of his works. They're, they're amazing. And some of the factors that various people have discussed as important to adoption are cost, validating, which hasn't happened yet, provably stores memories in animals, simplicity, reliability, and have my friends done. Does that make sense? Pretty obvious, right? So cryonics is affordable at ninety thousand dollars and up. It's definitely affordable, especially with life insurance. But it's a special set of people, isn't it? People who are willing to put that money ahead, people who live in societies where they've got a certain amount of wealth. Right? We'd love to raise that. We'd love to figure out how to get cryonics even cheaper. We'd love to uh, bring in other techniques like plastination, which is chemo preservation. And Ken and I think that plastination could start at $20,000 and go down to, who knows, $5,000, $3,000, especially in other countries. right? Say you don't have 5000 you didn't do your life insurance in advance. Well, maybe you, for the last you know, six months of your life, you can move to an elder care facility in uh, a, a less developed country. You know what medical tourism is, right? It's a, say, I think a $7 billion a year industry now. And you uh, spend your last six months, year, whatever there, and get your procedure done for a third of the cost, which is typically, it's at least a third of the cost, most medical procedures in many under, many less developed countries. And some well-developed countries, like if you want to do IVF, you'd go to Israel 
you would get it for one tenth of the cost of the United States, right? So various places are going to be specialized in these things, and there will be cost competitions as the value goes up. Next slide. So what's plastination? Well, it's basically fixing all the proteins in your brain with a, a chemical called an aldehyde, butyraldehyde or formaldehyde, and then putting it in the bath, fixing the fats, um, fixing the um, but fixing the fats and then pushing out the water and pushing in plastic. And that's how you make this basic paperweight, which is, here's um, Carlos Baptista, who's the head of this society that makes these paperweight plastic proteins. Okay. Now, these things don't perfectly preserve all the ultrastructure because they don't use protocols that reach all the capillaries of the brain. Now, the interesting thing about brains, if you've ever seen a brain, like a nun the nun study, the Alzheimer's study, you can have brains that are almost completely rotted out with Alzheimer plaques. And the person looks normal. Why? Because they spent their entire life with social interaction with other people, because they uh, challenged themselves mentally. Right? So we absolutely know the brain is a brilliant system at preserving what it cares about. It stitches it down into proteins, and it does it super redundantly. How many times have you forgotten a person's name, name and what do you do? You, you noodle around, you remember some other aspect of the person, and the next thing you know, you recreate that connection, don't you? That's the power of an associative memory. It's ridiculously fault tolerant and redundant. So we here, sitting today in 2014, have no idea how much damage a brain can take and the person's still there, or 80% or 90% or 99 We don't know. In fact, we have brains from the 1880s. Uh, Carl Bro Broca, the famous, Paul Broca, the famous anatomist, preserved 250 brains, including his own, in Paris in 1860, sorry. <laughs> and Carl Sagan in 1979 broke his brain and said, is Paul Broca still there? You know, we have Einstein's brain, it's sliced up pretty significantly. But we have several of these brains in formalin. If you look at them under electron microscopy, there's been some a lot of membrane, De almost all the membranes are ruptured, but the proteins are still there. The protein cage is still there, because that's what is fixed by the aldehydes. Could, you, could, could a smart program just take that and read it and just pull the information out of it? We don't know. We are at the very beginning of asking all these questions. Right? Next slide. And if we could, then there's going to be a lot of 1880s experiences excuse me, coming out of these 200 brains. <laughs> In fact, uh, it was uh, ben Benjamin Franklin said, I would love to be pickled in a cask of Madeira wine and come back in 200 years and see what happens in my beautiful republic. He wrote this in a letter. It's a beautiful, beautiful letter. <laughs> so a lot of people have been thinking about this question, right? Is there something that could, that could uh, preserve the things in my brain that, uh, that I care about? And responding 50 minutes after death is the critical element here, right? It's called standby. This is where most of the cost happens in brain preservation. You gotta get in, that's a human circulatory system with everything else eaten away. It's preserved with the with plastic, right? It's a beautiful tree, you can't really see it well here. But basically, your circulation goes everywhere that matters in the brain. And you can get these, these chemicals into a brain in a person within 15 minutes after they've died, and you basically preserve everything. And we have all these cool ways of extending that 15 minute window. Um, if you give oxygen after death, there's a person who died, they kept them alive for 96 minutes with CPR and a cathograph until they got them to the hospital where they shot them back to life. Okay. So if you're willing to do that, you live out in the boonies somewhere, that's another very simple way you can preserve a brain long enough to get it cryonically uh, or chemo preserved. There's anti-clotting agents, agents like Coumadin that will go in and make it much easier to perfuse the brain and stop the circulatory system from collapsing after death. And there's ways of lowering oxygen demand. And there's people that do all kinds of research in this space um, that really need a lot more money to do that work. Excellent. Where will the brains be stored? My bet is most of them are just going to go into cemeteries because that's the least behavior change for people. And if you look at life gem, you can take a person's. What is life gem? Anybody? Someone knows what this is, right? 
heard of it? What do they do? Yeah, they can press your apartment and your ashes into a diamond that you then wear. Isn't that crazy? Oh. I should say crazy. It's interesting, isn't it? It's what people do now. So cemeteries would see this just as an additional option. Some people would just want to have mom or dad, you know, plastic paperweight on the mantle. <laughs> you know? Who knows, right? I mean, everyone's going to make, make their own personal choices about this. That's kind of how high freedom democracies tend to work, right? But my argument is, most what's going to happen is you're going to see most of it happen in the cemetery. But now, let's say this is 20 years from now. People will look at the cemetery, Granny's in the ground. Granny will stay in the ground? Maybe not. I don't know. You start changing people's definition of death, don't you? We already got Granny's avatar. And maybe Granny's memories are going to come out. Maybe Granny's going to come out. Next slide. So how's it done? You take, you take one of these plastinated brains, you get a piece of it. This is, for example, the zebrafish brain or the fly brain. Right? Um, and they, they do this with pieces of mouse brain too. You slice it, you cut it thin, you image it, and then you reconstruct the synaptome, basically, and the connectome, right? All the synaptic weightings at the ends and the connections. Next slide. And the resolution of this is five nanometers, which gives you all the structures, all the organelles, all the um, uh, synaptic structures that look like they matter, but it doesn't give you the individual brain proteins. So there's some people who think, well, you gotta know how many ubiquinations or how many methylations there are on these key proteins. And by the way, uh, our neurotransmitters. Um, uh, you gotta know it's not the size of the synaptic neurotransmitter uh, vesicle, but you actually have to know um, some, uh, something to do with the molecular tags in some of these key proteins at the, at the synapse. If that's true, next slide, then we'll have to, oh, actually. So this is the competitor that's probably gonna win the prize for the mouse brain. He submitted the brain, and it looks great throughout the entire group on electron microscopy, okay? So that's what's happened this year. Okay. So we'll be announcing that if, if he wins, right? You have to actually do the imaging and, and trace the circuits and show that there's no disruption. Okay. We'll be announcing that hopefully later this year. Next slide. If you think you actually have to image at the level of the protein, we know we can do that now too. So this is probably the first example. It's called cryotransmission electron microscope, where you freeze small amounts of tissue and you look at it with a transmission electron microscope. We can image individual proteins. We can image individual molecules. This doesn't blow your mind, it blows my mind. And there's one step cooler than that. You know what MRIs are, right? You know how MRIs work? They, they basically get all the water molecules, all the, the nuclei of the hydrogen and the water molecules spinning in one direction, and then they relax it, and then it sends out an FM radio signal, and that's how they determine the structure. Well, it turns out you can do that for the nuclei of all atoms. It's called multi-quantum MRI. So you can use an MRI to read out the molecular signature of all the molecules in a sample. And so, again, this is being done for things on the scale of, uh, of uh, a millimeter with, a, with, with diamond probes. We can read out, at that scale, all the molecular information. So that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Imagine a world where, in the future, you can take a plastinated brain or a cryopreserved brain, you can read out at a molecular scale, copy the brain, not only that, I'm trying to read you out one more. You can do it while you're alive. We don't know, I mean, it's wet and noisy, maybe you couldn't, right? So that's another level of difficulty, isn't it? But imagine if you could do it while you're alive, too. So what does that mean? That means technology has given you the ability to back up you. Is that interesting? All right, so now I want to get really weird. You backed yourself up. You did a you did a multi quantum MRI scan of you. Let's say this is thirty years from now. Got your brain preservation contract too for the end of life. But you did it while you were alive, just in case you know something happened. You were out on Mount Everest, or whatever. It turns out you went. You, you tried to climb K two, 
and you died up there. But you have an MRI backup of you that's, oh, let's say it's a, a month old or a year old. And then someone boots that up into a computer. Is that you? How many people think that's you? Let's see. Well, this is a really small fraction. I mean, this is seriously probably 10% of the audience think that's you. So you see how the second step is realize a new human option to live again? That's the most important. It's the second way of looking at it, isn't it? That is by far the most important. Is realizing that that's actually you, and then arguing over how much of it is you. Right? Or how important is it that that you be brought back? All right, let's, let's skip ahead. Oh, that's it, actually. This is the slide. This is the 20th slide. This is really where we can stop. Like I said, there's more slides. Are up, these are up on uh, our website. But uh, really, we can just stop here, I think. And then just go to questions afterwards. Because... How many people think that if a copy of you was made, um, I'm sorry, how many people think that if you were preserved, uh, chemo preservation or acquired preservation, your actual molecules of your brain are preserved, and then some nanotechnology is used to attach you back to a biological body, far in the far future, that's you. So, let me ask that question one more time, just to be sure, because that was, that was at least 20% of you, but I would, I would have thought at least half would have said yes. So your actual molecules of your brain are preserved, and then nanotechnology is used to attach that brain back up to a future body. How many people think that's you? Okay, so that's closer to half. Yeah. I think that's where we're starting. Right? We're starting with that question. What is you? How many people think that you, um, because your consciousness is interrupted when you sleep, when you wake up the next day, how many people think that that's still you? More than half. Yeah, that's reasonable, isn't it? Okay, what if you drown in cold water for up to an hour and a half, which has happened with kids? Absolutely no EEG, no electrical signals of, whatever, of any kind in the brain. It's flat, completely flatlined. And the brain is actually starting to decay. But it's decaying so slowly because it's, you know, almost zero degrees. And then you shock that person back to life. How many people think that person is still the person? So that, again, that's probably a little more than half, right? I think everybody else is just tired. You don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> then there's the Mohr Horvick procedure. You know, you know what that is? Where you take a piece of a person's brain, you replace it with a computer uh, pattern that does functionally the same thing. And that's what a cochlear implant is. Two hundred or three hundred twenty thousand people have this piece of their auditory nerve that's been replaced by a machine. How many people think that that person is still? functionally uh, normal person. I would too. Then you just keep adding pieces, like the artificial hippocampus that Ted Berger created in, in uh, USC, and he's replaced the hippocampus, which is a primitive piece of cortex in mice, with this little chip. He doesn't know how it works, but it works. It's called neuromorphic engineering. Probably heard of it. How many people think that, that that mouse is still a mouse? Can you get tired of raising your hand? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. All right. So it just gets weirder from here, doesn't it? You got that backup of you. Let's say you backed yourself up and you come back in 50 years, and the first thing you do is you split yourself into two copies of you. How many people think you are in both places right now? This is good. So we have our hardcore 10%. They're not dropping. And like I said, you, you've taken advantage of the molecular with a multi-quantum MRI, you've made a backup of you, something happens to your biological you, you boot that back up, the 10% who originally raised their hand to that question, they know that they're still there. Their consciousness was interrupted, it was just a longer amount of interruption. 
What an interesting world we live in, right? Biology figured out how to create genetically identical twins, duplicate the pattern that makes two humans that look functionally the same from across the room. Technology is soon going to figure out how to create mentally identical twins, or triplets, or quadruplets. Or if you read Charles Strauss Accelerando on a complex question, you might fork yourself mentally into a bunch of different copies of you, attack the problem from all these different angles, and then reintegrate yourself later after you've solved the problem. <laughs> and in fact, in multiple personality disorder, which is now called dissociative disorder, we actually see that happen in living brains, don't we? Living normal brains can dissociate to the point of not being aware of each other, and they can be reassociated with a good cognitive behavioral therapist or good experiences for the person. Right? So the brain itself has that ability to do that. It's fascinating. And now we're seeing technologies adding these other layers. And I guess the question we have is, you know, what's the value of this? Let's skip, let's skip, skip, skip to the very end, uh, last two or three slides now. Now, what is the value of this? Right there. Uh, go back. The number one. Right. Too, too bad. Well, you might you might preserve your brain for science. You know, to understand mental variety. You might do it because you think that's the way you're going to build a smart machine. I personally happen to think that's how we're going to solve the AI problem. Is by understanding human algorithms enough and being able to instantiate them into machines. That's my personal belief. That's how it's going to happen. And it's also, I think, how you're going to build trustable AIs. Because I think most humans are trustable. And the ones that aren't, we police them. Percentage of people that are psycho or sociopaths are always a tiny fraction. And if you think about it, you need them. We need a few psychopaths. They tend to be you know, CEOs, generals. <laughs> and very quickly, we punish them if they break too many rules. So society has a natural... Read the Lucifer Principle by, uh, Howard, by Howard Bloom, right? which is about evil, the value of evil, the value of breaking rules. There is some value to it, but we try and keep it to a tiny fraction. We regulate it carefully in a statistical sense. My argument is that's probably what we're going to do with our AIs. 10,000 years ago, could you trust a small dog or cat with a baby if you left the room? What do you think? No. But after 5,000 breeding cycles, almost every breed of dog or cat, we can leave the room with that small baby. And we know we can trust it, even though we didn't design that brain. We selected it. Make sense? My argument is that's how we're going to create machines that get smarter without us making them smarter. And we feel uh, we can trust them. Now, we're going to disagree, right? We're going to see them, won't we? That's the exciting thing. We will see how AIs are built. Next slide. So you can do it for science, you can do it for memory donation. Like I said, you want to give behind your virtual memories or cultural preservation. You want to see a human experience zone that can be served. And imagine the value of the laws that can be created, how more accurate our laws will be when we, that human experience only is available to be seen. Next slide. You could do it for self-identity, like, like we were describing. Right? Next slide. Now we get to some interesting motivations. These last two, I'm going to try and convince a few of the people in the room who don't think of the value, like this gentleman with the beautiful uh, yellow pants in the back. Yeah, I love, love that fashion. <laughs> Quite some of that stuff. Could this, if it gets inexpensive enough, could this be Pascal's new wager? You know, I don't know if it's valuable to preserve. But hey, there's a lot of information in there. It would disappear otherwise. And you know what I'm going to say in my contract? I'm going to leave it to the future to decide if it should be rebooted. Maybe my family, my future family, my future institutions, my church, my, my own avatar might decide who wants to reboot me. Yeah, a little weird. <laughs> or I'm just going to say, hey, future society, it's your choice. And is the latter the humblest choice? You know, I don't know. It's like, yes, maybe I want to reboot this simulation, but I don't want to bring it to consciousness because that might be a little traumatic. Because it would say, first thing it would say is, where's my body? Give me a body, damn it. <laughs> Have you seen people that are locked in syndrome? And they, they, that guy that wrote the whole book by blinking his one eye? It's not nice to be completely disembodied. The first thing you want to do is say, hey, give me some body. Give me a robotic body. Give me any kind of a body. 
But would it be nice to be able to reboot a simulation of Einstein and kind of discuss what he thinks today about you know modern quantum theory or some or Picasso and see what kind of art you know he might want to create in the current world? I mean, think about the interesting or just your granddad or grandma. And again, we're assuming the cost of this goes to zero, aren't we? We're assuming the kind of singularity curves here, aren't we? That the cost of doing this stuff just gets cheaper and cheaper because we manipulate matter and energy and space and time at smaller and smaller and smaller scales. If you want some really weird thinking on that, look at my article, The Transcension Hypothesis. Okay, it's on the web. Transcension Hypothesis. The idea that as intelligence gets smarter in the universe, does it go to outer space or does it go to inner space? What do you think? Where does intelligence go? Where's the great frontier? Is it the stars or is it the area even smaller? than the subatomic scale. What do you think? I would definitely think it's the subatomic scale. And in this transcension hypothesis, I just give you examples of how intelligence goes further and further into inner space. It gets more and more ability to understand and manipulate outer space, but it gets actually more and more bored of outer space. Because it's more and more exciting going into inner space. Next slide. Now here's the last and most interesting question. Why you might want to do this. Imagine if you have 100,000 people who preserve their brains, because it's pretty inexpensive, and they did it. They're friends of mine. In any society, any country in the world. And they expect to get, you know, those brains to come out in the future, say 50 years from now. But some asteroid hits and wipes out the whole planet, and so Earth's experiment just ended. So you never get any information out. Was there any real benefit to them doing it 50 years, 60, 100 years before they could have brought the information out? Was there any benefit at all, or was it just a waste of money? I would argue there's tremendous social benefit. And so now I'm going to try and weird you out, get inside your head a little bit here. A society where that's happened is going to have, have lots of interesting questions about what the afterlife is and what the present life is what the meaning of life is. That society is going to have a lot more interesting debate around those questions. And, because 100,000 people have done it, I would say that society is significantly more science and future oriented. Because there's a, everyone knows a crazy uncle that's done it. Everyone knows somebody who is thinking, well, yeah, it's going to be pretty awesome in the future. And this is going to start shifting the amount of money we spend on science as a society today. What percentage of money does the United States have its disposable budget does the United States spend on nanotech? What do you think? Yeah, it's less than half of one percent. Do you know China spends more as of last year on nanotech than the United States of America, and they have five times less of a discretionary budget? That's that's really angry, isn't it? Why do we have so little science or education? How do we get more of that? Well, I would argue this is one very powerful way. More progress orientation, more people believing in the idea that the future can be better. More future orientation, more preservation, preservation of everything that's valuable, right? Species included, right? Cultures. More sustainability orientation. I'm not going to piss on the future because I might be back. More truth and justice orientation. I already mentioned if something bad happened to you and the guy got away, well, hey, I'm going to do some digital forensics and at least shame that person's family in the future. At least get the evidence out. And more of a community orientation. So we call these preservation value set. If you Google that phrase, you'll see our, our uh, suggestion of how this is how you really start to help a society today, regardless of what comes out in the future. Next slide. So how many people have heard of uh, the Netherlands uh, Life Ending Society? One of the leading societies in the world. They're one of the first ones that got the legal right to commit suicide, right? Uh, physician assisted suicide. And there's, I think, five countries, five or six countries now, and three U.S. states, soon to be four. I think the fourth one is Vermont where this is legal. 
And you can think of lots of reasons where a person might want to do that. I mean, they're under te terrible pain. If anyone's ever heard of Les Nyan syndrome, right? you, you read this stuff and you say, well, if, if, absolutely, I would want that freedom to be able to end my life. Seven percent of all Netherlanders die in palliative care, most under sedation, like morphine. But did you know that 2.3 percent of all citizens in the Netherlands choose euthanasia? Is that kind of mind blowing? Kind of is, isn't it? Percentage is higher now. Because that was 2012. I got these statistics. And for almost a year, they fought to get mobile euthanasia clinics to come where? Oh. To their houses. So for eight, nine years, it's been legal to do euthanasia in a hospice or a hospital. But when you, once you have 130,000 members of a group, what do they get to do? They get to lobby. And so in May 2012, they got mobile euthanasia clinics. Do you think that 2.3% is going to go up? So start imagining what our society would be like if we had 100,000 people who had done a brain preservation contract. There's 2,000 people that have signed up for cryonics. That's awesome. I think it was 100,000. Not just in the United States, but in every society. How does that group start to change the dynamics of the world we live in today? Next slide. This is what we end on. It's a vision here. Imagine you have a reliable connection with the reservation group procedure that's been proven. That's probably going to happen in the next five years. Maybe ten. Right? I mean, we're working on it. Other people are working on it. Imagine that it's been demonstrated to preserve associative memory in model organisms. You've got all kinds of organisms where they talk them simple things and then they preserve, scan, upload, and they say, unblinded the study and say, yep, there it is. That's how, we, that's how they learn. That's what they do. And then we get 500 neuroscientists to sign a statement saying that some significant neural information would be preserved if this was done on a human. That's all we have to say, some significant neural information. You make a decision how important that is to you. But memories, at least, right? And then we start putting incentive prizes out, we start lobbying, and then people out there just start offering inexpensive, less than $20,000 elective brain preservation procedures at death, probably going to be in a few urgent cares and hospices in some of the biggest cities, and then slowly start to expand it. And then we start seeing brains getting stored in cemeteries, contract storage, and private homes. And then a patient's bill of preservation rights becomes law in some of the leading countries. There's going to be some discussion, some, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of uh, legal wrangling around this, right? And then it becomes an optional standard of care in every country. Now today, what percentage of people in developed societies would like to live beyond their biological life? David Ewing Duncan did this survey. Take a guess. Here's some numbers. Two percent. I hear from the back. If I hear three? Five? 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 I hear six? Ten. It's one percent. It's only one percent. But that's still that's three, that's over three million people in the United States alone, isn't it? A lot of people. How do you get that 1% to go higher? The book When I'm 164 is where that comes from, if you want to read that. It's an e-book, it's a beautiful e-book on it, but When I'm 164. Well, you have to do all these things, I think. That's how you get past that, that 1%, and you slowly expand it. Right? And then once 100,000 people or so, some threshold, have done it, Significant positive social change occurs. That's our vision. I hope it's valuable to you as well. Last slide. So you can go to our website. If you want to know more about this, get it on our newsletter. You can share this stuff. Go on our social network. Donate to our nonprofit. You can volunteer. We meet every every two or three weeks uh, on Skype or Hangout. We'd love to have a few more people here volunteering. Lots of little projects you can do, you know, help grow our social network, etc. You can respect other people's end-of-life choices. You know, we don't we don't belittle them, right? Because everybody makes their own meaning. But at the same time, we can demand our own legal, accessible, and affordable brain preservation procedure. I think we're at the stage now. Science is at the stage where we can do that. That's my personal belief. You can help your friends understand both their biological and digital selves. Because you can see, if you start building a person's digital self, 
this, this life logs, these avatars, there's more and more of a case of, well, hey, maybe my biological self will want to. And the last point, you know, we should be amazed because modern science and technology are amazing and we're super awesomely lucky to be living right here right now. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. That was great. We're going to take a 20-minute break now. If you want to ask John some questions, you can go out there. If you didn't get fed at the last break, you can go in there. There's plenty more, and now we even have rice. But John Smart will be out there for 20 minutes answering questions, and there's more food. Thank you.